Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the 2022 Notre Dame Fall Conference. Comedy and the Creative Arts is the session which you are in here. My name is Ken Hellenius. I am the Communications Director, Communications Specialist at the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture, which means I handle all of our social media, our podcast, our website, our thank you letters for our generous donors, things like that. But on the side, I also get to host a radio show, weekly radio show that is syndicated across the United States on Catholic radio stations called Living Stones with my dear friend, Notre Dame alumnus Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And I also write a monthly column for the diocesan newspaper here in the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend called Humor in the Mix, which is about joy and humor in the life of the Christian. And so I'm not saying I'm a funny man, but I'm saying I understand the theory of comedy, which is really something that we're going to be talking a little bit about this afternoon. We have three fantastic panelists that are with us, and I realize now that I actually forgot to ask Claire how to pronounce her last name. I'll just let you struggle. <laughs> so we have three fantastic panelists this afternoon, as I mentioned before, because repetition is the key to comedy. Our first presentation will be on Creation and Creativity, or How NFP Made Me a Comedian, by Claire Vaidanayathan. That's pretty good. It's pretty good, something like that. Uh, she is an independent scholar. She is the mother of six children ages one to 13. She has performed stand-up comedy in the US and India. Her sketch comedy videos can be found on YouTube and on Instagram, and I can confirm they are very, very funny. Our second presentation will be Beyond Satire, Cultural Engagement with Our Ridiculous Reality. And the presenter will be Dorian Speed, who is at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. She is currently an MFA candidate at the University of St. Thomas and is working on her first novel. And our third presentation will be, Can We Still Make Satire? Little Independent Systems of Order Amid Metaphysical Hysteria by Alexander Taylor at the University of Dallas. He is a PhD candidate in literature in the Institute for Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas where he received an MA in literature and a BA in history. While serving as the Cowan Fellow for Criticism and Institutional Strategist for the Donald and Louise Cowan Archive, he is at work on a dissertation which unearths the shared political vision of two 20th century Catholic novelists, Flannery O'Connor and Evelyn Waugh, through an examination of the way in which their imagined modern cities lack civic friendship and xenia, which is hospitality classically understood, as reflected in their refiguring of the Western literary tradition. Three fantastic presentations, and we will begin with Claire. Thank you. Please welcome her. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the awesome intro. That was really, really great. Um, my name is Claire Vaidyanathan. I have six children, and I am a comedian. I have a presentation slide, slides for you here, so let's see if we can get it to work. That's not right. We're gonna try that again. Play. Yes. Here we go. That's not right either. We're gonna try and go back. All right, here we go. This will have to do. Just this. No. No. Here we go. How NFP made me a comedian. Um, we're gonna feel the burn. This is the burn I'm talking about. This is Bernadette. She was born in 2018. In October 2018, at 28 weeks gestation, I developed fevers and they wouldn't go away. And the doctor I went to see, he's like, it's just a virus, it'll go away, don't worry, it'll go away. It did not go away. 30 weeks gestation, I was admitted to the hospital with fevers that no one understood, no one could explain. The doctors were like, well, this is interesting. I was a medical mystery. I was a curative conundrum. I was, as the head of maternal fetal medicine told me, fascinating. 
At 32 weeks, Bernadette decided she had had enough of being fascinating, went from breach to head down in under 12 hours, and began to vacate the premises. My placenta also decided it had had enough because it detached from my uterus, a condition known as placental abruption. I found out later that placental abruption is a thing that will get you to the head of the line at the ER because without immediate intervention, the odds of bleeding out are pretty, ba pretty bad for you and the baby. Anyway, moving on. Bernadette was born on Sunday, November 25th, 2018, Christ the King. My anesthesiologist's name was Emmanuel. <laughs> he doesn't go by Emmanuel most of the time. He's like, that name has too much, too much power. I just go by this other name. And I was like, hmm, you can't make this stuff up. She spent one month in the NICU and came home on Christmas Day. Advent was very meaningful for us that year. Um, this is me here, this one. There we go. Um, as I said, I had a placental abruption. The fil final diagnosis was something called velitis of unknown etiology, which is fancy doctor talk for your placenta and uterus didn't like each other and we still don't know why. It was also 30% necrotic, which is fancy doctor talk for dead. And as I said before, I was considered fascinating by the, by the entire maternal fetal medical team at the hospital I was at. My doctor went on to write a medical journal article about my condition. I learned that you do not want to be the patient in an episode of House. You do not want to be fascinating. Fast forward to January 2020, but forget that it's 2020. Bernadette was over a year old at that point. I was, I was determined that it was time to get back to stand-up comedy. 2020 was gonna be my year. <laughs> and I was sitting in an open mic. If you're not familiar with an open mic, an open mic is a very casual performance where stand-up comedians get together, try their new material out on an audience, usually of other stand-up comedians. And I was waiting my turn to try my new stuff and this guy I knew walked in to the open mic. I hadn't seen this man in 18 months. He was one of the comics I knew. And he saw me and he came over and he was like, whoa, where have you been? Weren't you pregnant the last time I saw you? And I said, yeah. He's like, how did that go? And I told him. I told him everything I just told you. And he's, he listened and he was like, oh my God, man. That sucks. Whoa. But I bet you got some good material, though. <laughs> and to my surprise, I said, yeah, I did get some good material. High fives ensued. What do we learn about life from stand-up comedians? I think this story really illustrates well the perspective of the comedian, which is, Every bad thing in life is just an opportunity for humor. And that leads us into one of our great laws of comedy, which is comedy equals tragedy plus time. That means that any tragic situation, if given enough time, and if you word it properly, can be funny. And if you do not believe me, I strongly encourage you to check out Dress to Kill by Eddie Izzard, in which he tackles Hitler, Stalin, and genocide. Who knew genocide could be funny? But more, what do we, what do we have in common with a stand-up comedian as a believing Christian? There are a few things. Every comedian I've seen or met seems to understand these three things in a very deep and personal way. One, the world is messed up. I am messed up, and it shouldn't be this way. If that's not the Christian perspective, I don't really know what else is. This is Maria Bamford. Does anyone know who Maria Bamford is? Good job. 
All right, so Maria Bamford is a stand-up comedian and she also suffer suffers from bipolar disorder. Oh, it's still working. Okay, she suffers from bipolar disorder and a lot of her comedy, especially in the, re uh, the f last few years, has been about her mental breakdown, being in a mental institution and recovering from that. So when we go to do stand-up, we're not just trying to make people laugh. We're also processing our trauma and we're telling the truth about difficult things. This is Mike Birbiglia. Who knows who Mike Birbiglia? Okay, he's a little bit more mainstream. Mike shared with us in his most recent Net Netflix special that he didn't really want to be a dad. He's only a dad because his wife really wanted to be a mom. That is a hard thing to tell thousands of people on Netflix. And then he also shared with us that he was a pretty crappy husband in the first two years after his daughter's birth. This is Russell Peters. Anyone know? Okay, good, good. He specializes in the immigrant experience. What does it mean to be a kid in Canada growing up in the 80s with Indian parents? And of course we have Dave Chappelle who has currently made SNL lose their minds. He is very well known all over the world, but especially in the US for talking about race relations and has recently upset a lot of people by implying that trans women might not actually be women. I don't know what to say other than he's willing to upset people in order to tell the truth. So not only is stand-up confessional in nature, it's where we tell the truth, I would argue that stand-up is also fundamentally religious in nature. Funny story about this pic, no, this pic. So when I, look, when I typed in open mic, this is what I got. <laughs> with stand-up, you have a guy down front with a mic telling a room full of people what's wrong with him, what's wrong with them, what's wrong with society, and maybe at some point in the future, we won't all be such a mess. And the audience laughs, which serves as this kind of amen, creates a moment of communion between the comedian and the audience. And guess what? You're at a bar, so there is wine. <laughs> I think Stephen Colbert talked about this in a very meaningful way recently when he was inter being interviewed by Dua Lipa, which is, I am a Christian and a Catholic, which means which are always connected to the idea of love and sacrifice being somehow related, giving yourself to other people and that death is not defeat. Sadness is an emotional death, but not a defeat if you can find a way to laugh about it because that laughter keeps you from having fear of it. Fear of it can lead you to turning to evil devices to save you from the sadness. No matter what happens, you are never defeated. You must understand and see this in light of eternity and find some way to love and laugh with each other. Comedy is not a denial or belittling of suffering. Comedy is a proclamation that the evil of this world will not defeat us. So what does this have to do with NFP? Okay. The first meaningful experience I had with comedy was when I was in 2013, after I had had my third child in four years, and my husband and I were watching Conan O'Brien, and a man came on and said, yeah, we got five kids, because my wife is a Shiite Catholic, which means there's no goalie. I thought, oh my God, this man knows what I'm going through. I immediately looked up everything that Jim Gaffigan had to say, <laughs> We read every book he had up until that point and every special we watched. And this joke will go with me to the end of my days. No. <laughs> if you want it, for those of you who can't see it. If you want to know what it's like to have a fourth child, just imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. <laughs> so what's the deal with NFP? Thank you. <laughs> I'm working on my Jerry impression. Anyway, um, for those of you, I mean, raise your hand if you know what NFP is. Okay, all right, oh, okay, okay. That's the only question I'll ask about this. All right, moving forward. 
what, what, okay. what makes NFP different from contraception? Let's start there. So natural family planning, as I think all of you know, is the method by which you space births in a marriage depending on using a woman's infertile period to engage in marital intimacy and then using her fertile period if you want to have a kid. We've never had that problem. So what makes it different from contraception? With contraception, you have in an ideal situation, a husband and wife talking with each other frequently about what they want for their family, what method they're going to use, and how they feel about it. But ultimately, to contracept correctly or effectively, you only really need one person. But with NFP, to, to use NFP effectively, you need three people. You need you, your spouse, and your NFP instructor. <laughs> I don't know what's more natural than that, bringing a third person into questions about if and when you get to have sex. For us, these are the methods that we are familiar with. Uh, symptothermal, Creighton, and Marquette. It is not like we didn't try. So, it's not real pee. I just dyed water yellow, but that is a real monitor. Okay. So what are, we, what are we talking about with NFP and what this means for our family? For us, NFP has been reliably unreliable. And I do not mean we took a chance day and then got mad that we got pregnant. I do not mean we just can't control ourselves. We're nymphomaniacs. That is not what I mean. What I mean is you have two well-educated individuals who have the best of intentions, who believe that this is what Christ wants for his church, and have done their darndest, and have still ended up with four unplanned pregnancies. For us, NFP has been a failure. And yet, Michael is a Lego enthusiast, an excellent friend, an artist, a sensitive soul, and he loves his mom but I still stand by the reasons we were trying to avoid getting pregnant. His older sister was only 10 months, we were poor grad students, et cetera, et cetera. That was failure number one. And then we've got Frankie, who is always cheerful. Strangers are just friends he hasn't met yet. Always shares candy, always ready to play. But I still stand by the reasons we were trying to avoid, avoid which was we were still poor, we were still going into debt, and my husband's job, which was our only income, was about to end. And here we are, back to Bernadette. Um, she does steal lollipops. <laughs> anyway, we had four kids and life was crazy. I don't stand by that one anymore. I think that's no longer valid. But this one was certainly valid. This is Isaac. He is our adorable squish muffin. And I almost died having Bernadette, so we thought, surely we have a very good reason to avoid at this point. And that's not what happened. So moving forward, how, what does this have to do with comedy? Well, if we return to our first law, which is comedy equals tragedy plus time, and if we use the transitive property from high school algebra, we know that comedy <laughs> actually equals NFP plus time. And we have to take a moment to look at these failures and ask ourselves, are these really failures or are they just opportunities for comedy? Are they opportunities for joy? As a friend of mine put it, you can be pissed about NFP and be grateful for your children. It's not one or the other. It can be both. And in light of this, I have to think about the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. I'm not going to read all of this because I'm running out of time. But I am going to move forward to the next slide, which is the ultimate failure, which was also the ultimate victory. And my final words are from Mick Jagger, which is, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you get a lot of kids, <laughs> which might just be what you need. Thank you very much. You can find me on YouTube and Instagram.
right, thank you so much, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here. And I, I know you had a lot of choices today of which panels to attend, and I appreciate you choosing this one. Um, in the finest traditions of my calling, the physician Abra Abraham Nussbaum defines medical training as a series of vision les lessons. He's talking about the loss of a patient at the beginning of his residency, and he says that the medical staff all looked at this patient and reduced the dying woman to a massive heart attack. He asserts that prolonged experience leads physicians to see individuals as a compendium of parts and money, money and parts. It's a reductionist view of the human person, and it engenders cynicism among practitioners and ruptures this relationship between the physician and the patient. Well, scrutinizing one's fellow human beings is as necessary a practice for fiction writers as for medical professionals. Douglas Bauer argue, argues that our culture, in which sarcasm is understood to be wit, has devolved to a point of general cynicism whose passive stance is resignation and whose aggressive one is irony. So how should Catholic writers and thinkers approach this close study of our fellow man and what do we risk as diagnosticians of the human heart? These questions are possibly nowhere more important than when the work in question is satirical or comic, as cleverness often abets cruelty. The theme of this presentation is not just Twitter can be bad sometimes, but that might be you know, a relevant <laughs> instance of cleverness abetting cruelty. Muriel Spark, and can we pause to appreciate the greatness of this author photo, was a master practitioner of sharp economical satire, often drawing liberally from personal experience. How many of you have read a work by Muriel Spark? The most famous one is Prime of Miss Jean Brody, Girls of Slender Means, and then about 400,000 other books and short stories. Her output was voluminous. While some may see her approach as more of a catty than a Catholic aesthetic, this is to miss the deeper reality of her fiercely comic works. Her advocacy for, the real, for realism about the fallenness of human nature can be instructive for writers who hope to employ the comic and the ridiculous in their fiction. In his recent manifesto, my colleague who will be speaking tomorrow, Joshua Wren, and also, or, or Saturday, Saturday is the Friday of the soul. Um, <laughs> Joshua Wren explores in his manifesto, ca Contemplative Realism, how Catholic writers are called to contemplation of both nature and humanity and painterly attentiveness as a hallmark of contemplative realism. Meanwhile, Sparks portrayals of far more flaw of flawed, often fatally flawed characters are more like editorial cartoons or caricatures drawn as, in as few strokes as possible, expertly capturing features in order to provide instant recognition. Now, we may not instantly recognize the Colombian poet whose first name I've forgotten, but his last name is Leon, but this was a uh, caricature drawn by one of his fellow poets. I don't know if that's a thing poets are always doing, or I, I know at least one instance, other instance of a poet drawing a caricature of another. Um, her usage of the early giveaway also lets readers in on the secret of where the story appears to be headed. But even without this technique, we can intuit the character's fates from her skilled illustrations. So when you read a Spark novel, even if you don't recognize the character as, you know, in, in intimately or immediately connected to someone else you know, you she economically sums up the person so well that you think, yeah, this is exactly what that person would do, and this is exactly what would happen as a result. So she and all of us who are creating this comedy is scrutinizing closely. Well, one of the best characterizations of what it feels like to be examined and diagnosed is in T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which I assume you're all familiar with, but maybe you're not familiar with JulianPetersComics.com, which you should be because, oh my gosh, there's a whole graphic illustration of this and many other poems that I discovered long ago when I was preparing my slide presentation <laughs> at least 12 hours ago. Um, <laughs> so when, I assume you can read this, but I will read it for you, and I have known the eyes already, known them all the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, 
and when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? For the Catholic writer, the challenge is to remember that each individual, even the most apparently loathsome of specimens within a collection, is created in the image and likeness of God. To be a contemplative realist of the human heart is not to overlook or excuse moral failings, but we must not, as Joshua Wren has remarked, confuse scenes that reveal characters with scenes that obscure and exploit it. Here is Dame Muriel again. I feel comfortable talking about her today because she is deceased, but she was fairly famous for if you crossed her in any way, you would show up in one of her works uh, fixed on the wall. So um, just let us gaze upon her once more. In her acceptance speech for the Ingersoll Foundation's T.S. Eliot Award, Spark argued that culture has degraded to the extent that earlier approaches no longer apply. Eliot's utopia called for a spiritual elite, an aristocracy of taste, learning, manners, and morals. Nothing of that kind can now occupy the mind of any reasonable, educated, and full-blooded human being. Eliot's analysis of the decline in his ethical and aesthetic standards, which he observed in the world around him, was brilliant but no one who fully loves life could possibly now accept his solution. This is in about 1970 that she is saying this about the world. As a result, she asserted that only one instrument remained for the Catholic literary physician. If this is a triggering experience for you, I would ask you to look at the tacos and not the <laughs> instruments. The rhetoric of our times should persuade us to contemplate the ridiculous nature of the reality before us and teach us to mock it she argued in her most famous speech, the desegregation of art. Portrayals of the gross racial injustices of our world or tyrannies of family life on the individual might be good things in her formulation, but they must go before they turn bad on us. Why? She recognized that audiences felt convinced that they had fulfilled their moral responsibilities by summoning the correct emotional responses to portrayals of sin and suffering. We can marvel at her prescience about most so modern social media interaction, performing displays of crowd-sanctioned emotion and then instantly reducing the complex to the dismissive quip. Casual readers of Muriel Spark may overlook the new, whoops, no, we gotta look at these people again, <laughs> may overlook the nu nuance of her satire and interpret her characters as merely savage towards one another. Her narrative perspective is often described as godlike, but she recognized herself among the sinners. We should know ourselves better by now than to be under the illusion that we are all essentially aspiring, affectionate, and loving creatures. We do have these qualities, but we are aggressive too. In a diary entry for Slate at the end of her life, Think back to those days, the early 2000s, when there were three places to go leave comments on the internet, and one of them was Slate. Muriel Spark was there. She elaborated upon her reasons for creating vicious characters. I have always marveled when people have described to me, either in fiction or real life, a creature who doesn't have a mean bone in her body or who is incapable of a mean thought. Who are these freaks of the human race and where? One product of an immaculate conception in the history of religion is surely enough. And besides, to be incapable of a mean thought would surely cut us off from that imaginative empathy with the weakness of others that makes our imperfect world go round. Even that great English writer of the last century, Cardinal J John Henry Newman, declared he could not conceive a novel without sinful characters. Spark also talks about the incredible discipline it takes to observe mass culture without succumbing to its in influence and remaining attuned to the reality of the human condition. So how does she create, as Helena Tomko, who will be speaking later during this session as well, um, has put it, playful anarchic satire as metafictive escape from religious sentimentality and a cunning alibi for prayer. 
How among all of these sharp bur barbs does she still preserve the rose? Key to understanding her approach is her claim to a poet's way of looking at the world. She began hoping to be a poet and then was asked to write a novel and thus her career was set in motion. Helena Tomko has explored the role of poetry in Sparks, The Girls of Slender Means, particularly Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland. The poem is referenced several times in the novel by one of the characters who's taking elocution lessons. And Tompo, Tomko describes these incidental snippets of verse as a private conversation between the text and the reader, where meaning bids farewell to satire and seeks out the company of poetry, scripture, and prayer. So we can imagine, um, sorry, we can imagine Spark holding up an x-ray to her characters and diagnosing them and showing us the problem. That's the central element of her satire. She professed to love her characters. She said, oh no, I love them all. When I'm writing about them, I love them most intensely like a cat loves a bird. You know, cats do love birds. They love to fondle them. Any other response might have risked sounding saccharine. One wonders if Spark viewed most of her fellow creatures in the same way, ready to pounce, as she described the writing process. She held popular Catholic piety, in of which this is not an example, this is piety for condensed milk, but uh, <laughs> she held it in tremendous disdain. Those terrible bleeding hearts, the saints, the pope, priest. It's very interesting to me that we don't have correspondence between O'Connor and Spark because I would have loved to hear their discussions of their private practice of their faith. Um, but we don't have much discussion, period, of Spark's own personal faith. Perhaps she feared that such overt expressions of devotion might alienate her own kind, really intelligent people, more or less intellectuals. I'm weary for them if I'm cut off for too long. So her dismissive reference to the saints raises the question, what might the Catholic satirist gain from engaging with the teachings of the saints? And how compatible is this art of ridicule with our call, call to holiness? Jacques Maritain, who, whom Spark believed was full of a bit of air in his belief that Catholics were the best qualified to novels, advised that the moral risk of depicting evil in fiction was dependent upon the altitude at which the writer operated. Spark has characteristically very elevated narrators who are at such a remove that they often tip their hands as to how characters are gonna move around, about on the stage, as when Lisa, the protagonist of the driver's seat, arranges her own murder. Maritain argued that the more deeply a novel pro probed human misery, the more it required superhuman virtue of the writer. Her narratorial detachment from the violence and cruelty of her characters could be misconstrued by readers at whose feet the cat is ready to drop another bird. So her reticence about her own conversion doesn't give us a lot of information about her own you know, personal faith life. But we can take instruction from the saints on every matter of our life, and particularly one as serious as this. And that's a cat. That's not a saint. So St. Catherine of Siena observed in her mystical dialogue with God that the devil invites men to the water of death, then catches them with pleasure under the pretense of good. Authentic knowledge requires understanding both humanity's capacity for depravity and the infinite goodness of God. In this contemplation of the human soul, she saw that the devil gives, every, gives to everyone according to his condition those principal vices to which he seems, sees him to be most disposed. So keeping in mind that a quick wit may incline one to cruelty and judgmentalism, the Catholic satirist, or the Catholic tweeter, should cultivate virtue lest he allow exposure to the inner recesses of wickedness to ruin his vision of all the goodness God has created. Another quote from Joshua Wren. We can also look at the example of St. Therese of Lisieux, who was described by members of her own community as somewhat of a prig because she was so, and uh, people often 
perceive her as deeply sentimental and saccharine, but she has a deep sensitivity towards the other members of her community. When she's irritated by a fellow sister in her community, rather than the, what I would do, of finding someone to joke around about with this or make mock the person, she offers prayers especially for the sister. So what am I saying? Am I saying that we should therefore never laugh at anything and only be silent? I don't know. What I am saying though is an eye that is trained to diagnose and that can see a disconnect between reality as it is and reality as it should be comes from a sensitivity. And if you possess that sensitivity, perhaps there are more avenues beyond just satire, beyond mockery. That is not to say that satire itself is bad, but consider whether there are other aspects of that gift that you could employ in your own life. And how would we do that? Well, without contemplation, without a deep faith life and a committed discipline to contemplation, we won't know if we're, there's the famous thing about, is it good, is it true, is it, what are the, whatever the three questions are you're supposed to ask before you talk that I never ask. Um, you, if you have that deep life of grace within you, you don't need to have that, try to, you know, like wear a bracelet or something to remind yourself to not be a smart aleck and hurt people's feelings or write a satire that tears down another real human person because you've already, involve that in the practice of your life. I, I hope you recognize these literary illusions. <laughs> so in closing, I would ask us all to consider whether, not necessarily the question of whether satire is what we should leave, go forth and do or not, because honestly, I can't imagine that anybody's going to decide that based on this presentation, although I could be wrong. Um, but just as we utilize and enjoy humor, how important it is to recognize that with that gift comes a responsibility to not dehumanize the person or the people around you. Even if you're engaging in self-deprecation, that you always keep that image and likeness of God at the forefront. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ken. Um, and thanks to the, the Nicholas Center for having us here and for, to my fellow panelists as well. Um, I wanted to start uh, with a note of gratitude to someone who encouraged this work at a, a crucial point, um, namely the recently deceased Father Ian Carr. Um, may the mercy of God be upon him and uh, the prayers of his patron, uh, St. John Henry Newman, be for him as well. The claim in the papal encyclical Lumen Fide that faith makes it possible for us to discern in nature a grammar written by the hand of God echoes intriguingly an aphorism written by a philosopher who appears at that encyclical's beginning as a youth contemporary to our age for his desiring novelty and adventure, namely Friedrich Nietzsche. In Twilight of the Idols, 1888, Nietzsche notes his concern that we are not rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. Having faith in grammar implies our reliance on an order which transcends the evanescent syllables which compose human speech a logocentric intelligibility. Confronting Western logocentrism would be a battle taken up by new disciples of Nietzsche in the 1960s and beyond, but the words of an earlier writer of fictions indicate that the real problem facing the West predated deconstruction. In a 1946 article for Life magazine, Catholic novelist Evelyn Waugh, acclaimed by critics as one of England's best satirical authors, provocatively claimed that he did not write satires. Satire, according to Waugh, is a matter of period and flourishes in a stable society and presupposes homog homogeneous moral standards, such as in the early Roman Empire and 18th century Europe. It is aimed at inconsistency and hypocrisy. It exposes polite cruelty and folly by exaggerating them. It seeks to produce shame. All this has no place in the century of the common man where vice no longer pays lip service to virtue. The artist's only service to the disintegrated society of today is to create little independent systems of order of his own. While literary critics have debated whether Waugh's works are actually satires, despite his disavowal of satiric intent, 
they typically fail both to see the irony in this statement and to ask what purpose these little independent systems of order serve. Waugh's comment serves to point us to the problem both the satirist and the West more broadly have faced since the long 19th century, that our lack of shared moral standards stems from a lack of shared metaphysical standards. Nietzsche perceived this mutual relationship as well, but from a different position, arguing against English novelists such as George Eliot, that because God is dead, or to adapt the words of William Butler Yeats, the best Christians lack all conviction, it is no longer tenable to cling to Christian morality. We cannot live on survivals in morality or in satire. Examining Waugh's theory and practice as a satirist, both aimed at exposing metaphysical folly, reveals his work, particularly his novel A Handful of Dust, to be a fictional counterpart to the more rhetorical satires of John Henry Newman, especially the Tamworth Reading Room. My reading of Waugh's novel and Newman's letters will examine their satirical practice so as to show a new mode of satire perhaps useful to us when both the grammar of creation and the grammar of language are hotly contested. Let me begin then with Newman. In Tamworth Reading Room, a series of letters Newman writes in 1841 to the editor of the Times under the pen name Catholicus, Newman subjects to severe criticism a speech made by Sir Robert Peel, then the prime minister standing for re-election. Peel had given a fulsome speech at the opening of a private reading room available to the public for a modest subscription in the borough of Tamworth in Staffordshire, something like a public library in the United States, but funded directly by subscribers rather than by tax money. At a first glance, one might be confused if the Newman who would write the idea of a university just 10 years later would at this time be opposing a library. But as many Americans have had occasion to learn over the past several years, the goodness of a library depends to a great degree not only on the types of books it promotes, but in how it sees its own mission. Newman does not oppose the reading room as such, but rather the meta-ethical ideas Peel proposes as the intellectual foundation for its opening. These letters have struck Newman experts such as Father Carr as satirical, and yet they exist in a society where moral standards are much less than homogenous. And in fact, these letters do not seem to be satire at all, if, as we're told by the best authority of the Cambridge Context and Literature series, what distinguishes satire from other kinds of writing is the moral purpose of the satirist. They certainly do not focus on the moral character of Peel as a satire by Roman authors Horace or Juvenal might. However, Newman's work fits comfortably within the second part of Waugh's definition. While changing course from the normal moral purpose of satire, Newman attempts to show the folly of Peel's ideas using satiric techniques, namely authorial detachment and exaggeration. The authorial detachment characteristic of satire can take place in various modes. In the case of a fictional satire, it might be the narrator's use of a simple factual tone or a lyric poet's use of understatement. In Newman's case, his authorial detachment is rhetorical. He publishes his letters in the Times under a pen name, Catholicus, is worth thinking about this choice, why Catholicus, give, especially given that these letters were written before Newman converts to Rome. This term would not have been antithetical to English Protestants who are more accustomed to using the terms Roman, Romanist, Romish, Papalist, Papist, you could go on, to describe those they saw as religious foreigners. Rather, Newman's pen name appeals to all Christians in England who hold to the apostolic creeds. Newman, through his choice of a persona, means to criticize Peel in a way which all creedal Christians in England will be able to sympathize with. In his first letter, Secular Knowledge Compared with Religion, Newman introduces Peel's speech. Newman's main argument in this letter is that Peel's general theory of morals and religion is deeply flawed because Peel insists not only that knowledge necessarily contributes to moral and re religious development, and in that way to societal peace and the common good, but also that knowledge to produce such an effect must be secular, devoid of religious controversy. Newman writes, human nature, he seems to say, if left to itself, becomes sensual and degraded. Uneducated men live in the indulgence of their passions, or if they are merely taught to read, they dissipate and debase their minds by trifling or vicious publications. 
Education is the cultivation of the intellect and heart, and useful knowledge is the great instrument of education. It is the parent of virtue, the nurse of religion. It exalts man to his highest perfection and is the sufficient scope of his most earnest exertions. By use of this final image, Newman shows us that Peel's argument lacks any active role for the Christian religion. Religion only appears as a fledgling child to be nursed by useful knowledge rather than to be the source of sanctification and moral growth. This absence is intentional. Newman adds, adds that for Peel, education and secular knowledge is a kind of neutral ground on which men of every shade of politics and religion may meet together, disabuse each other of their prejudices, form intimacies, and secure cooperation. Secular education, then, according to Peel, is a place where the best go to lose all conviction, except that of a need for secular progress. In letter two, secular knowledge not the principle of moral improvement, Newman humorously juxtaposes the place to which Peel assigns secular knowledge and the actual content of the sciences that he praises. Even as Newman praises Peel's tone as containing high aspiration, generous sentiment, and impassioned feeling, quite unlike the mechanical tone of his philosophical predecessor, Jeremy Bentham, such a tone is in service to talk of improved modes of draining and the chemical properties of manure. This example from Peel's address presents Newman's bathos, a shift of tone downward from the elevated to the ridiculous, indicating the real disparity between the content of knowledge contained in the reading room and the kind of personal, spiritual, and moral elevation which Peel promises it can offer. It is one thing to think that by discussing questions of ethics and the good, we might be led upwards as in a platonic dialogue to contemplate questions of religion and divine things. It's another entirely to think, as Peel did, that studying the chemistry of manure will lead us to rise at once in the scale of intellectual and moral existence. Throughout the second letter, Newman uses exaggerated imaginative diction to ridicule Peel's proposed solution to the disorder within the human soul, featuring ridiculous martial imagery. Peel's philosophy seeks to accomplish not a change of character, but a mere removal of temptation. Newman explains that Peel makes no pretense of subduing the giant nature in which we were born, of smiting the loins of the domestic enemies of our peace, of overthrowing passion and fortifying reason. While Newman has used mar martial language before and elsewhere, here his language is more exaggerated. We have a giant nature and have to learn to smite the loins of our appetites. He later in this letter asks, who was ever consoled in real trouble by the small beer of literature and science? Rather, he suggests we should seek the strong liquors of true faith and right action. By these and other uses of exaggerated diction and phrasing proper to satiric technique, Newman in the persona of Catholicus exposes the folly of Sir Robert Peel's elevation of secular knowledge to the position which the Christian religion ought to hold in the sanctification of human persons and the bringing about of peace within communities and nations. While Newman's letters are satirical and being meta-ethical in a time quickly losing moral consensus, Waugh's fictions are satirical in being concerned with the emergence of unreal religion in a time where many people feel that, to borrow a phrase from a Flannery O'Connor character, Jesus been a long time gone. By unreal religion, I mean social institutions which seek to preserve the benefits of religious practice without actually teaching the truth of Christian doctrine and urging their members to a real conversion of heart. Although Brideshead Revisited, published in 1945, is typically seen as Waugh's first Catholic novel, his earlier novel, the favorite of many secular critics, A Handful of Dust, published in 1934, is one of the first works after his conversion that seriously presents a Catholic vision of the modern city and its primary failure. That failure is the city's lack and even its corruption of the natural foundation of Christian charity, namely hospitality and civic friendship. The Catholic tradition proposes that grace perfects nature. Waugh's novel shows how various types of unreal religion, on the contrary, corrupt these natural foundations. A handful of dust contains three entities, 
which its characters think of as cities. The first, the protagonist Tony Lass ancestral home, Hetton Abbey. The second, the city of London. And finally, Shea Todd, an encampment in the Brazilian jungle. In each city, we witness a different kind of unreal religion. At Hetton, the mere customary entertainment of Tony's Anglicanism. In London, the novel entertainment of superstition. And at Shea Todd, the parody of liturgy, a very odd Dickens seminar. In each kind of unreal religion, the congregants are turned in upon themselves rather than facing outwards in order to welcome the presence of God. If hospitality towards God is the true foundation for friendship among co-religionists, we should not be surprised that there seems little in the way of deep connection between the participants in these various ceremonies. For the sake of time, I'll just focus on the first of these three, namely the unreal religion of entertainment at Hedden. The narrator subtly focuses on the way in which the primary motive of the churchgoers to the unnamed local parish seems to be pleasure. While, of course, one ought to enjoy going to church, that enjoyment should not be the purpose of one's churchgoing. It is not only Tony who poses in, as an upright, God-fearing gentleman of the old school, but the people of the village also think that few of the things said in church seem to have any particular reference to themselves. Despite this felt sense of irrelevance, the villagers continue to attend services. Why? The church at Hetton doesn't have a miniature golf course like that installed in, 19, or sorry, in 2019 in Rochester Cathedral, but Hetton's church also serves as a place of entertainment where the congregants attend for the vicar, an elderly man who had served in India most of his life, who had a noble and sonorous voice and was reckoned the best preacher for many miles around. While priests and pastors today looking to entertain their congregations might turn to hoverboards or light shows, the Reverend Tendril simply recites sermons composed in his more active days for delivery at the garrison chapel, doing nothing to adapt them to the changed conditions of his ministry. Lest we think our narrator is hyperbolic, we then witness the peroration of one of these sermons, witnessing the way in which the vicar's imagination still dwells on the dunes, but also the way in which a focus on not Christ, but on our gracious Queen Empress pervades the sense of purpose, bringing together Reverend Tendril's imagined congregation. Entertainment easily gives way to idolatry. Thus saith the Reverend Tendril, and so as we stand here bareheaded at the solemn hour of the week, let us remember our gracious Queen Empress in whose service we are here and let us think of our dear ones far away and the homes we have left in her name. And remember that we are never so near to them as on these Sunday mornings, united with them across dune and mountain, and our loyalty to our sovereign and thanksgiving for her welfare. One with them is proud subjects of her scepter and crown. That this is intended not as pious reverence of the monarch, but as satirical critique of the displacement of Christ the king is revealed by a bit of dialogue the narrator recounts immediately after the sermon. Reverend Tendril, he do speak on common eye of the queen, a gardener's wife had once remarked to Tony. Lest we see Waugh as a narrow critic of only an idolatrous royalism, we receive an account of the vicar's usual Christmas sermon, one to which his parishioners were greatly attached, in which we see past the facade of the reverend's imperial homiletics realizing the dramatic irony with which Wash shows us the character of Hetton's denizens. How difficult it is for us, saith Reverend Tendril, to realize that this is indeed Christmas. Instead of the glowing log fire and windows tightly shuttered against the drifting snow, we have only the harsh glare of an alien sun. Instead of the happy circle of loved ones, of home and family, we have the uncomprehending stare of the subjugated, though no doubt grateful heathen. Instead of the placid ox and ass of Bethlehem, we have for companions the ravening tiger and exotic camel. Of course, the uncomprehending stare is that of the Hetton congregation, including Tony and most of his guests, who find of interest only the tropes of the ravening tiger and the exotic camel, not realizing that the vicar's sermon unintentionally speaks the truth that Hetton, the modern city, is the place where the happy circle of loved faces is too often absent, replaced by heathens subjugated by their own base passions. 
The vicar's neglect of his duty to his congregation to challenge their complacency, the lukewarmness which Christ says in the Gospels he will spit out of his mouth, not only endangers the salvation of their souls, but has begun to corrupt the social goods that even the utilitarians wanted religion to support, namely hospitality, marriage, and the family. The problem that Waugh and Newman faced in recreating satire remains for the aspiring satirists of our time. If satire had aspired to mend the world, as the 18th century satirists claimed, today satire struggles to do more than prophesy what will happen in the next year or even the next month. You can go on the Babylon Bee and just search prophecy, and they have a number of posts of, here are all of the things that we said that have come true. Um, we may still be able to make satire in a new way in the 21st century, but can satire still make us good, or can it only merely entertain? Thank you. Well, we have time for questions. If there are questions for our panelists, or uh, how about we'll begin with Leah. You can go first if you want. Oh, me, okay. Um, <clears throat> this is actually something I struggle with quite a lot when I'm writing bits. So I was particularly struck by your, your comments on satire and like essentially how mean is too mean, right? And I think it really depends on a couple of things. It depends on your audience. Who are you talking in front of or writing for? Like I would not, I would not advise extreme irony for 12 year olds. Um, and then also the thing that comes to mind is a, a bruised reed he will not break. So when we're talking about how mean is too mean, and if you are, uh, if you're trying to shed light on something for the benefit of the person you're speaking to. So for example, I just saw a stand up comedian uh, go on, again, Colbert, <laughs> and talk about um, her IUD. And, how, and she started getting into the injustice of the fact that she had an IUD and her boyfriend never had to think about it again. I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. I mean, the fact that she's even bringing it up to a national audience, that it might not be fair, was a huge moment. I recognized it as a huge moment, but for her audience, how far is too far? What are they ready to hear? And then the other thing is like, if you're, if you're in a roast battle, you just do what you need to do, okay? <laughs> Most people are not gonna be in a roast battle. But the other thing is like with Twitter or with um, online, I think a private conversation, if you're really battling with someone online about what is right and what is not for the good of those who are reading, I think a private conversation away from, the, from whatever platform you're on might be more beneficial. Though I have had instances where me being extreme actually brought about a conversion, which was crazy. But uh, God works in mysterious ways. Um, that's all I have to say about this. So I don't have an answer. I don't know which microphone I'm supposed to use. Well, th this one works. Okay. Um, I think that's an excellent question. I completely agree that we see that the people themselves can become debased and cynical. And I think that um, we just don't consider strongly enough the weight of that responsibility. I am not a comedian. Uh, 
but I do teach high school and middle school. So <laughs> I'm very familiar with being in a sick burn based environment. And in that situation, uh, I remember a teacher, a professor telling me sarcasm has no place in the classroom, but she was an elementary school teacher. And I thought, you know, that sarcasm is the only thing that can be used in the classroom if your audience knows that you love them then you can be free and you can, and if you know the person well enough to recognize the things that can be teased about and cannot be. And, but the priority is knowing that these people that you are laughing with love them. I think that, and um, Spark herself, as I quoted, talks about loving her characters. Um, and, and many, I think Doug, Douglas Bauer talks about this as well, that in a work of fiction, you have to love the characters, and even that doesn't mean you never let anything bad happen to them, but you don't, they're not s reduced so much to cartoonishness that you're not revealing anything about the deeper reality behind the person. Um, but, and last, I would just say, uh, as with everything, we just have a duty to sit with Christ and to have that deeper relationship with Christ and have made time and it's a serious um, thing that's easy to neglect and this is what I see happening a lot of times is people who it, it, the constant pointing out of hypocrisy I mean it's necessary I guess but if this is all that people see us doing then it's just another form of what they see everywhere else um, I really appreciated the part of your question that had to do with like sorrow for the other and the just like what is the spiritual preparation, right? If you're going to be a satirist, if you're going to be, I mean, I think even more broadly like a cultural critic, right? Um, because I think there's this real strong temptation um, that, well, you start out by saying, okay, I noticed this thing that's bad and someone has to say something about it and so you say something about it. And you say, well, I noticed this other thing. And you keep noticing all of the bad things and saying, like pointing out truly all the problems with all the bad things. Um, but I think, I think that there's a way in which like we are constituted by the things that we repeatedly choose to look at, right? And so that um, if this is something that seems to be your vocation, you have to develop habits of looking at be like things that are truly beautiful and things that are truly good. I mean, the way in which the church gives us not only the sorrowful mysteries, but also the joyful and, and the glorious mysteries, as well as the luminous mysteries, um, right? And I think, I think there has to be that element for uh, the satirist especially um, of trying to not lose sight of the whole comedy, right? Satire is sort of a region within the comic terrain, right? But it's not the whole of it. And I think there's a need to try to preserve uh, that vision of the whole. Um, yeah, so a, a similar question about spiritual preparation and the normal sort of old-fashioned moral corrective function of satire that you would hope that in, I think I do this to my children most in most conversations by satirizing their behavior, they won't do that again, <laughs> that you have, you do it in a spirit of hope. And it, my question is really for Alex about Handful of Dust. Um, my worry with that novel is that I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's obviously the first Catholic novel but wasn't it written with a spirit of despair? I think that's what worries me most about that novel. And is that where Evelyn Moore had to go as a Catholic novelist, toward a kind of satire of despair? Or is there some way in which the novel fails <laughs> as satire because it does not offer a sort of posture of hope in its, in its aesthetic, that's that's the question. And, and for anyone who has either seen the movie or, or read the book, the, it ends in about the worst way a book ever could end with somebody reading Dickens forever in the Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great question. Thank you. Is this mic working? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Okay, I'll hold it a little closer. So that's a great question, thank you. 
Um, what's really fascinating to me about this novel in terms of how it ends is that there's the way the novel actually ends and there's the way that almost everyone remembers it ending. Because almost everyone remembers it ending with Tony last going to Brazil and getting stuck reading Dickens over and over and over again to his captor, right? But the actual ending of the novel, where it goes after that, um, is actually back to England. And you see the impoverished last cousins um, have kind of gained dominion over Head and Abbey. Um, and there's a way in which their existence is impoverished, right? They're not able to operate the whole house as Tony had been doing. But when you look at the whole novel, you see that Tony, right, has been trying to uh, have his cake and eat it too, right? The way in which uh, the nobility often are sort of impoverished and doing all they can to maintain appearances while taking out tremendous debts, right? This is the sort of thing Tony is involved in. And so I think what you see with the impoverished last at the end is actually a flourishing family life, right? And it's not perfect. No, no flourishing family is perfect, right? Um, but there is that vision of hope of like, what can we expect out of this tragic world? Like what kind of beautiful things do we have to look at? And it's normal families. So I, I would challenge uh, the assertion that it is kind of an aesthetic of despair because I think there is that kind of important moment at the end where you do have some hope for the future. Thank you. I believe we have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, given the shortness of time, I'll try to be very direct. But do you think, and particularly the last two speakers who focused on, well, particularly Alexander on like some sort of like reform of satire, is it possible um, to have humor in our daily lives with some, without some degree of mockery, without some degree of sarcasm or hurting the other person? And if the answer is no, are holy people destined to just give up humor in their lives? Is this bad for virtue? Are we destined to vice? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think that's that's really useful. Um, I would I would say that we're not doomed to a, a humorless life, or even even a life in which the only humor we have is mockery. Um, the really most common feature of my life in terms of humor is the really, really terrible dad joke, right? The worst puns you can possibly imagine. I mean, my friends will tell you, they're like, oh my gosh, this guy, like he's impossible sometimes, right? And there's a way in which like puns are not, well, some of you will disagree with me, puns are not offensive in the way that mockery is offensive at least, right? Um, and, and I think too, I think that, that there is an appropriate um, role for mockery, right? Like among friends, like if your friend is doing something that's not good for them and like, you know, maybe it's not the right time to sit them down and say, hey, we need to have a serious talk about your habits or about whatever. Um, like just a, a gentle way of teasing them, right? It is still mockery in a way, um, but it's mockery with a view to that person's good, right? And so I think there's a way to integrate that into uh, a flourishing uh, spiritual life. I am not a scripture scholar. I've seen it argued often that Jesus himself uses um, humor and irony in his parables. And um, I would say that owning a dog is a great way to have a injection of humor into your daily life that dehumanizes no one. Because, um, for example, my dog just ate my students' homework. And so that, you know... <laughs> It's, it's just great. And, um, so he got 100, probably for the rest of the semester. But I think it's um, certainly possible. And to be honest, I think if I were to say, no, it's not possible, I, then who's going to change anything about their life on that basis? I think a lot of it is cultural and the dynamic of the family in which you grew up. And that, that, you know, the lines of what is to mean, et cetera, depend a lot upon the culture in which you were raised. But um, willing the good of the other is not culture specific. And if you order your life towards that and ask God to guide you in that way, then you will know whether or not your, your humor is appropriate rather than just having a blanket yes or no. I, I, just what you said is, uh, it just made me think really quickly is that, um, 
I do wonder if the hypersensitivity in our culture is kind of a result of very small families. You don't get to be a snowflake when you're number four <laughs> out of six. Guess what? You know, you don't get to take yourself that seriously when there's eight or nine of you and, oh, I didn't get exactly what I wanted. I, didn't, I don't know how many times I told my kids this week it was a lot, but I did tell them life is not fair. Oh, well, several times this week. So I do wonder this kind of like how fragile have we become as a society as our families have gotten smaller. That's just, I don't know, I'm throwing it at you guys now. Now you get to think about that. Well, thank you very much to our panelists, Alex, Dorian, and Claire. <laughs> Mass is at 515 in the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. Sorry, I just about went elsewhere. Um, and then the next official event of the conference is the keynote address at 8 p.m. in the Morris Inn Ballroom by Robert Pogue Harrison. That's 8 p.m. in the Morris Inn Ballroom immediately across the street from the McKenna Conference Center. So thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>